Let us continue with the chapter on planning now and uh, move to the subject called analytical review. Uh, the question I would like you to turn to is a question for studying um, analytical review in some detail. But before we look at the question, ambitious, I'd like very briefly just to introduce the idea of analytical uh, review. Um, as I've no doubt mentioned before, analytical review is nothing other than what it sounds. It's review using analysis. It's called analytical review because you do some review with analysis. I mean, review, just check out that word. Uh, view is looking at things and review is looking at things again. So what happens is the directors look at the numbers and we review them. So that's review. And then analysis is using your head. So it's, it's looking at things using your head tests are called analytical review. Looking at things using your head is analytical review. But there's a particular technique within analytical review which is most closely associated uh, with analytical review, and uh, that's ratio analysis. And it's ratio analysis that the question ambitious um, asks you to address. Um, yeah. So let's turn now to the question ambitious. The question is called ambitious. And being good boys and girls such as we are, we're going to turn first of all to the requirements and make sure we know what we're being asked about. So turning to the requirements of ambitious now. Um, you're required to explain whether you believe that the performance for the current year as uh, ended on the 31st of December and the financial position as at that date have improved as a result of the new policies adopted by the company. Uh, you should support your answer with appropriate ratios. Now, um, you never know with the examiner. He might be good and he might tell you exactly the number of marks that he's going to allocate to ratio analysis. But if he leaves it entirely up to you, then assume six. If you've got a 12 mark and he's asking you for, you know, appropriate ratios, then assume six. And the reason you assume six is the six in particular that really get to the heart of a business. There's lots of ratios, but the six in particular that get to the heart of a business. They are um, gross profit margin, return on capital employed, stock days, debtor days, and creditor days, and finally, gearing. So they are gross profit margin, return on capital employed, stock days, debtor days, creditor days, and gearing. And those six ratios, those six key ratios, are the six ratios that we're going to calculate in our answer to part A. But do take a look at the requirement. It says you're required to explain so the other six marks are for explaining. And given that we're going to be explaining six ratios, you can see how it's going to work. We're going to calculate the ratio and then explain it. What we're actually going to do is calculate all six ratios first and then explain them uh, one after another to give us six marks. There's actually going to be a 13th heading coming out of this because, look, it says you, you should support your answer with appropriate ratios. No, not that one. Explain whether you believe the performance of the current year and the financial position as of date have improved. So our last uh, heading will be conclusion. Yes, the business has improved, or no, the business has weakened as a result of the new policies discussed. Um, so that's going to be the structure for our part A. And then B... Describe the matters you will investigate in your audit as a result of the above review. Now, it's very important that you read and identify this reference to as a result of the above review. So anything that we discuss in part A, we will then audit it in detail in part B. So um, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself now, but just to give you a flavour, if we say that, if we suggest that sales has gone up in part A, then we're going to audit sales in part B. If we suggest that uh, loans have gone up in part A, then we'll audit loans in part B. It's very important in a question like this when it says as a result of the above review, it's very important when you get a part B that refers to a part A that you do take that on board and make sure the two tally. Okay, it's a, it's a lovely question. Um, you'll need a calculator. Um, normally I don't need a calculator because you'll be here with me in the classroom working out the numbers for me, but as I'm here in a studio without any students to do the calculations for me, I have my trusty Casio calculator, ta-da! 
So I'm going to be working my way through the numbers as you do so uh, on your laps. Okay. So let's read the scenario first and get a bit of a feel for it before we start bashing out numbers. Um, the directors of Ambitious appointed a new sales manager towards the end of last year. This manager devised a plan to increase sales and profits by means of a reduction in the selling price and extended credit terms to customers. Um, the idea being if you drop your selling price and you extend uh, the amount of credit you give to customers, you will have more customers and therefore you will increase your sales volume and hopefully the profit with it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This involved considerable investment in new machinery early in the current year in order to meet the demand which the change in the sales policy had created. Hardly surprising, really. Um, the more you sell, the more you have to make. Yeah. Uh, the draft financial statements for the year ended 31st of December, current and comparative, are shown below. Uh, the comparative figures, of course, we would have audited last year, but the current figures we're just taking a look at for the first time now. And we're going to, um, we're going to work our way through some ratios in order to work out where the risk areas are in this business so we can focus our audit efforts in those areas. The draft financial statements for the year ending 31st December, current and comparative, are shown below. The sales manager has argued that the new policy has been a resounding success because sales, and more importantly profits, have increased dramatically. Well, is he telling the truth about the sales? Well, as you can see, the sales used to be $800,000 and they're now $3.9 million. So it is true that the, you know, the sales have absolutely rocketed up. So we have created an enormous demand by the reduction in our selling price. But when you have a look at um, any of the profits, it doesn't really matter particularly which one. But um, do you want to take the one called profit retained at the bottom there? I mean, it's gone up by two two thousand pounds. It's got two thousand dollars, sorry, and two grand is neither here nor there. So is it true to say that profits have rocketed up? Nope, it's not true at all. They have increased marginally. And uh, let's have a look over the page. Presumably, when we see the statement of financial position, uh, we're going to see more machines uh, within the machines. And the answer is yes. Got a lot more machines. Uh, three times more machines. And as we work our way through the figures, can you see that the bank has swapped from being an asset bank in the comparative figures to being a um, liability bank in the... Uh, in the current figures. That means we've gone from an asset bank to an overdraft. And, um, well, there's nothing particularly else I want to say that won't be given by the figures. So let's have a go at this question. Let's work our way through the ratios first. So it's ratios first. And just to remind you again, the question is called ambitious. So it's the question ambitious. So part A, we're going to have a current here in the middle and comparative on the right. And we work our way through, starting with uh, number one, um, gross profit margin. So number one, gross profit margin. So GPM. Uh, GPM, gross profit margin, is a comparison of the GP, the gross profit, to the sales, expressed as a percentage. And... Um, Really, if, you, if you're good with a calculator, you can just bash down the figures, to be quite honest with you, because they're only worth half mark, half mark each. So if, if you're good with calculators, just slap down the figure. If I'm really honest, I'm, I'm rubbish with calculators. So I'm going to have to watch myself like a hawk, because there's no one else here to watch me. But um, I, I'm going to help myself by actually writing out the numbers, and that will slow me down, hopefully make sure I get it right. So the two gross profits are... Um, 6.40 now and 2.20 back then. Is that correct? Yep, that seems to be correct. And the, the figures are 
Uh, fig figures on the top line are 3.9 now and 800 back then. And I'm going to express those as a percentage using my trusty old Casio. So 640 uh, divided by 3.9 is 16.4. Um, should we just have 16%? Do a bit of brutal rounding. Exactly how you express yourself, very much up to you. 2, 2 uh, divided by 800 is uh, 27 and a half. Goodness me, that's a bit awkward. Uh, I think I'll go for 28. I'll round up for no particular reason. Um, this is hardly surprising. What we see there is what's called a, a profit margin squeeze. When you have... Um, a profit margin going down, it's referred to as a profit margin squeeze. Now, the things that can cause a profit margin squeeze are, number one, the sales could be down. Number two, uh, sorry, uh, I'm not just talking about sales, you see. You've got to be careful with your phrases on this one. The sales price, the sales per unit could be down. The sales per unit could be down. The sales price could be down. The cost price could be up, or both. Right? That's the, that's the only possibilities. Either the sales is down, the costs are up, or both. So the sale price is down, the cost price is up, or both. Well, in this particular case, it seems highly likely that the sailing, sales price is down because it tells you that the sales price is down in the first paragraph, talking about the new manager's strategy. So we've pretty much got that one nailed already. The reason that the gross profit margin has gone down is deliberate, a deliberate decrease in the selling price, and that's caused the profit margin squeeze. But we don't mind a profit margin squeeze if it increases the wealth of the, of the business. Now, this is measured in a, a fairly old-fashioned uh, ratio. Well, not not old-fashioned, it's just old. It's still in fashion. It's called ROS. Return on capital employed. Capital employed is a little bit, is, to be honest with you, the phrase capital employed is a little old-fashioned. And uh, capital employed basically means finance. And there's two forms of finance. There's debt and there's equity. So we have uh, ROS is equal to the profit before interest and tax, rather cutely called PBIT, the profit before interest and tax on on capital employed, on debt plus equity. And the PBIT is the profit before interest and tax. And um, if you take a look at the income statement, on the income statement, you'll see that the PBIT hasn't been provided by the examiner. In a real set of financial statements, you have to show the PBIT on the, financial, on the face of the financial statement. But this isn't a real financial statement yet. It's just in draft, and therefore we're going to have to work it out. Um, the easiest way is to take the net profit and to add back the interest. So, for example, taking the current figure, we've got a figure of 128, and then we add back a figure of 112, and what do we get there? We get 30, 40, 240. So the profit before interest would be the profit after interest, adding back the interest. So that's that one. And then on the other side, we've got a 1, 2, 3, plus... 9, which is 132. And um, over the page, we pick up the debt and the equity. Now, debt is a very loosely defined term. Um, essentially, it means long-term lending. Um, so we're just going to look at non-current liabilities and look for anything which seems to sound like it's long-term lending. And uh, borrowings is, is what we're talking about here. So we have now a fairly huge figure of 26 uh, but we used to have 100, much smaller. And equity, be very careful with equity. Equity is the whole of the equity, not just the share capital. It's the reserves as well. In other words, it's uh, 1421 in the current year, 1421 and uh, 1315. 1315 in uh, the prior year. And there we go there. We're going to calculate the rows in each case and um, 
Here we go. I seem to be getting almost exactly 6%, which um, is not bad. If you were investing in a, a bank account and you were getting back 6%, you'd say it was okay. But it's not that great when you're investing in a company because you've got risk involved in that. So you'd expect a bigger return than that. 10% is okay, and this is just below. So... That's not the end of the world, but everything's relative, right, in these analyses. So we can't really say much until we've seen the other, the other fella. Which is 9%. And these figures work out like this. 9%, for example. What that means is for every dollar that we put in, we get back 9%. Cents. For every dollar that we put in, we get back nine cents. Or we used to, that's the point you see. Now we're getting back six cents, whereas previously we were getting back nine cents. So, and that's as a result of this strategy. So do we feel more wealthy than we used to? No, we flip and don't. So as far as we're concerned, this strategy has not been successful. It may have increased sales volume, but unfortunately it seems to have made us less wealthy as a consequence. But may, may, maybe there's other factors. So let's keep going. Perhaps there's other compensating factors. Maybe things aren't as black and white as I'm saying. The next three are the working capital ratios. And um, exactly how you describe them is entirely up to you. Um, you can call them um, stock days, debtor days, and creditor days. Or you can call them inventory days, receivable days, and payable days. Uh, or some people prefer the phrase turnover. Uh, so it would be inventory turnover, uh, receivables turnover, and payables turnover. But to me, those are becoming increasingly difficult to say. So I'm going to stay with stock days, debtor days, creditor days. So stock days. Is equal to. Closing stock over cost of sales. There's actually a few different ways of calculating this. But this is certainly the quickest. But once you have that ratio, you need to multiply by the number of days in a year, 365. So it's closing stock over cost of sales multiplied by 365 is uh, stock days. So we now have 238 on stock now, and we used to have 30 back then. And we need to look at the income statement for the cost of sales. So the cost of sales is 3260 for the year just gone, and it used to be 580. And I'm going to multiply by 365. And multiply by 365 to turn this ratio into more malleable days. So it's 238 divided by 3260 times 365. 27 days, approximately. So... Uh, it's a manufacturer, isn't it? It does seem to be a manufacturer. Uh, so pretty quick, actually, from uh, the uh, raw materials arriving to the finished goods going out only takes us 27 days. Doesn't actually, does it say what they're manufacturing? I don't remember hearing what they're manufacturing. So it can't be cars, because that would be a miracle, 27 days. So maybe toys or something less complicated. These type of pens, that wouldn't take long, would it? Um, so, yeah. It seems okay, but we don't really have much of a feel for it. 
until we compare with last year. None of these things are absolute, so what we need to know is how they were doing last year. Better, I imagine, and then we can be critical. These questions are quite often based upon being critical. Well, it's not that... Oh, no, it is. It is quite a big difference, isn't it? 19 days. Yeah, we're far less efficient than we used to be. I better do double-check that. Far less efficient than we used to be. Um, so we're going to be critical as regards the stock. And you can probably imagine, to keep things simple, the examiner just keeps on with this, the company's getting worse, the company's getting worse, to, to make it easier for us, really. Now the receivables, otherwise known as the debtors. So debtor days. Equals trade receivables. Over sales multiplied by 365. So trade receivables over sales multiplied by 365. So let's get our trade receivables first from the statement of financial position. 583 and 83. And the sales... Three nine hundred and eight hundred. So it's five eight three divided by three nine hundred times three six five is good Lord. 54 days. Well, the question did talk about offering extended credit, and the customers have certainly taken it. It doesn't tell us how much we're offering extra, but we've probably offered them 40, and they've taken 54. But anyway, like I said, the important thing is comparing one to another, so let's get something to work with by comparison to the, the previous year. Thirty-eight, So it's way worse. If you offer 30 days credit, which is the usual period, if you offer 30 days, um, it can be pretty difficult keeping your debtors at 30 days because, you know, if they actually make the payment on the 30th day, then the bank um, cash won't clear until maybe three or five days later. And that's if they pay on the 30th day. So 38 is not bad, actually. But 54 is hopeless. Right. Then we've got uh, creditor days. So creditor days is equal to Trade payables over cost of sales. Be careful with that one. Over cost of sales multiplied by 365. So uh, we find our creditors in uh, current liabilities. Uh, 275 now, 42 then. And cost of sales, we already have it, don't we, don't we, from the stock figures, from the stock days. But I'm going to take it from the income statement. Like so. And then multiply by 365. Yeah, good. So 275 divided by 3260 oh, 
multiplied by 365. 31 days. And 42 divided by 580 times 365, 26 days. Well, it's not bad. Um, it's closer to how it should be. Or maybe, in fact, actually it's better in a way because it might be slightly better. Um, it depends on what the suppliers are providing, but if the suppliers are offering 30 days credit, then we're taking 30 days credit, whereas previously we weren't. So you could possibly argue that those figures are better. So I'd better just check them. Thirty-one days. And twenty-six days. So you might be surprised to hear when, when that one goes off. It's a bit more difficult to discuss, but it's certainly better for cash flow. And then the last one, gearing. Gearing is debt on debt plus equity. Uh, so we have these figures already, don't we? But uh, let's get them again from the balance sheet. So the debt is two six hundred and was one hundred. And fourteen twenty one and thirteen fifteen. So here we go. Sixty four per cent. And seven per cent. That's really rocketed up. Presumably because of the required expansion in the business that was required by the increase in demand. And um, that's a big problem. And we're going to discuss it as we work our way through the ratios. So let's double check the requirement. Explain whether you believe that the performance for the current year ended the 31st of December and the financial position at that date have improved as a result of the new policies adopted by the company. So we'll start with the performance ratios of GPM and uh, ROS. We can't really be positive or negative as regards GPM. It's just what you'd expect to see if, um, if a business expands by reducing its price. So here we go. Let's have a paragraph on GPM. The gross profit margin is down. And uh, I can't remember the uh, movement there, so I'll just remind myself. Uh, 16%, 28%. So it's 28% down to 16%. Uh, don't think you've got a mark for that. That's just stating the figures as they are, stating the totally flipping obvious. Um, the gross profit margin is down. Uh, it's, it's all about the maybe, really. Uh, in which case, this seems more than maybe, more than highly, it seems highly likely. This is almost certainly simply because of the uh, deliberate 
reduction in selling price. Uh, this is almost certainly simply because of the deliberate reduction in selling price. And it's that second half of the answer that's getting you the mark. Um, moving on to return on capital employed. Uh, the rose is down as well. This one I think I do remember. 9% uh, down to 6%. And, um, it, well, it seems that the business simply isn't as efficient as it used to be. This... Maybe because the business is less efficient. Before it was small but very efficient and now it's bigger and less efficient. And frankly the shareholders will be disappointed in that. Because where previously they were putting in a dollar and getting back nine cents, they're now putting in a dollar and getting back six cents. So it's particularly that figure that gives us the answer to the overall question, which is, has the business improved? Well, the answer seems to be no. And it gets worse when you have a look at um, stock days. The stock days is up, which is bad for cash flow. Let me see if I can uh, identify the number of days. Uh, remember the number of days. What was it again? Uh, 27 and 19, so 19 to 27. The stock days is up, which is bad for cash flow. Uh, the more cash you have tied up in stock, the less cash you have in your pocket, essentially. Um, this may be because... Uh, stock control is uh, is losing control. In the expansion. And we will audit that may be in part B. Uh, this may be, this is maybe. If I said that, this may be. Because stock control is losing, this is maybe, I think I mean to say, this is maybe because stock control is losing control in the expansion. Good. Okay. Uh, what's the next one? Debtor days, I guess. Is that debtor days? No, that's stock days. So debtor days next. Uh, this is up too. And um, I can't remember the figures, but it was over 50 now. 54 and 38. So 38 goes to 54 days. This is up too. Um, um, yeah, this is up too. And this is also bad for cash flow. The 
more of the debtors you have tied up, more of the cash you have tied up in your debtors, the less you have in your pocket. Um, this is deliberate, isn't it? But it appears that there might be a loss of control. This uh, is partly deliberate. Do you remember, it says in paragraph one that there was a, a strategy to offer extended credit. If you offer extended credit to your customers, you expect your debtor days to go up. You expect them to go up, but I suspect you that what they wanted was an increase of two, three, or four, and they ended with, up with a huge increase, although up to 54. This is also bad for cash flow. This is partly deliberate. But may also indicate, um, should we say bad debts? Because that's going to be very easy to audit in Part B. So we're suggesting there might be some bad debts in the debtors, and that's the reason. Um, creditors? Creditor days? This one seems okay to me. Creditor days. The increase and what was it again? Twenty six to thirty one. Have I said that right? Let's go back and check it. There we are. Twenty six to thirty one, yeah. The increase twenty six to thirty one days is good for cash flow. And seems sensible. Uh, given the lack of cash in the bank. And frankly that one's a little bit dull with out too much risk in it. So when we come to do part B... I might actually skip over that. I'll see how I feel. And uh, which brings us to gearing, which is definitely bad. Gearing. Gearing is high, which is taken to mean greater than 50%. And that is simply taken to be bad in these exams. In more complex exams, you could argue there are certain upsides to high gearing. But here in this nice simple exam, F8, we're just going to take that to be bad. Gearing is high. This is bad. Because it increases... The risk of default on interest payments on payments and so increases the risk of insolvency. This is bad because it increases the risk of default on interest payments and so increases the risk of insolvency. There you go. Uh, that is the end of Part A. But I think I would probably argue that Part A is easier than Part B. Part B, um, you really do have to think, and it's, it's quite a challenging question, I suggest. See, see what you think when I work my way through, or as I work my way through. The important thing when we are working our way through is to address each of the points that we made um, in part A. There's actually eight marks in part B, aren't there? So six of those will come from part A 
and the other two marks will be free form, I suppose. Oh, I tell you what, it's lucky that I remembered this because the question kind of demands a conclusion, doesn't it? Let's go back to part A. Explain whether you believe that the performance for the current year and the position at their date have improved. So both for the benefit of part B and for the benefit of the conclusion, let's see what we said. Well, GPM, we didn't say much about that apart from it's down. We're quite neutral about that. That was because of reduction in selling price. But we're very negative about the return on capital employed. So that's definitely one mark against the strategy. Um, stock days, well, that's gone up. And debtor days have gone up as well. So there's two more marks against the strategy. Creditor days was okay. So the business is coping on the supplier side. But gearing, gearing is horrendous. So the business is definitely weaker than it used to be. There's a greater risk of insolvency. So conclusion... The strategy has increased the sales volume but now the business is less profitable and much weaker. So its position is weaker and its uh, performance is less profitable. Um, the strategy has increased the sales volume, but now the business is less profitable and much weaker. Okay, so now let's work our way through part B, which kind of involves working your way back through part A, starting with GPM. GPM was, was really about sales, wasn't it? And what we've been told is that the unit selling price has gone down. So how would you audit that? You just look at the uh, selling price on the internet and compare it to last year's sales price list. to um, verify the uh, unit selling price has decreased I would compare a current price list to a comparative price list I would compare a current price list to a comparative price list. To verify the unit selling price, has decreased, I would compare a current price list to a comparative price list. What was the next one? The next one was Rose, wasn't it? What did we say about Rose? The business was less efficient. Um, what could we do about the business being less efficient? Um, well, that's a hard one, that one, actually. What can we say about the business being less efficient? Let's see if there's any hints in what we said up there. Uh, oh, goodness, jumpy, jumpy. Uh, there we go, Rose. The Rose is down as well. This may be because the business is less efficient. Well, I've said it, so it's a bit of an awkward one to audit, but I'm going to go for it. Uh, Rose. Plus efficiency. Um, I can assess the business efficiency by um, observing uh, production uh, in the factory. I can assess business efficiency by 
uh, observing uh, machine usage in the factory. Uh, I can assess business efficiency by observing machine usage in the factory. Tough one, that one. But at least stocks and uh, debtors are easy. So uh, stocks. What did we say about stocks? They were less efficient with stocks, didn't we? Um, so what should I do here? I think I will I'll inspect. I will inspect the raw materials. <laughs> I kind of half changed my mind halfway through that sentence. I really fancy doing uh, aged analysis, you know, I really do, so I think I'm going to do it. I was kind of toying with whether to go for aged analysis on debtors, which is the more common place to see aged analysis. But I really fancy it on stocks, so I'm going to go for it. I will inspect the raw materials aged analysis and investigate... any old stock for possible impairment, as they often call it these days. In other words, you know, writing it down or writing it off to zero. I will inspect uh, the raw materials aged analysis and investigate any uh, old stock for possible impairment. If, if you've never seen an aged analysis, the way an aged analysis works is it's got um, a list of the stock and then the total figures in the first column. And then um, it's, it's usually done on Excel. You know Excel spreadsheets? So you've got a list of all the different stock lines, the total value in each stock line, and then it's divided into further columns, uh, one month old, two month old, three month old, and older than three months old. And you just look in the, in the, far, uh, in the far column just to identify any old stock, and that's how you do it. Okay, so that's that. Then what we've got? Uh, debtors. Or I should, uh, should call them receivables, shouldn't I, when I'm actually writing the sentence, just to show I can you know, swing between the two. Debtors. Um, bad debts, we said. That should be fairly easy to spot. I will review... Uh, correspondence with debtors to identify any possible uh, bad debts. That may need writing off. Uh, I can't get all excited about payables, but what the heck, I might as well put something on payables. So, um, creditors... I mean, as long as the creditors are okay with us taking 31 days, then, then 31 days is better than 26. So we'll just look and see if there's any creditors who are particularly annoyed with us. And we can do that through um, looking at the correspondence file as well. But maybe we'll just talk to the um, supplier manager. I will um, ask the supplier manager... Uh, if he is aware of any problem suppliers uh, 
and I will investigate those. And hopefully there's none. Uh, which brings us to gearing, doesn't it? Which is the, the, the really awkward one. Now, the problem with gearing, as we mentioned, is that the, the, the higher the gearing, the greater the debt. The greater the debt, the greater the interest. The greater the interest, the greater the chance of failing to pay that interest, and therefore the greater the chance of going bust. But picking out one particular feature in that flow, uh, we mentioned about the potential failure to um, pay an interest instalment. Let's look for that. I will uh, inspect bank records to confirm there, there were no uh, I will inspect bank records to confirm there were no um, failures to pay interest. Uh, no defaults on the interest payments, if you prefer it that way. I will inspect bank records to confirm there were no failures to pay interest. And we've worked our way through the six ratios and uh, we've, we've got six marks, which is, which is good. Um, there is a problem at this business, is there not? And uh, therefore I suggest that our eighth mark should be actually looking at the strategy and seeing if they've changed their strategy to, uh, to suit the, 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 the problems that they've created. Um, in other words, I want to see a turnaround plan. If I see a turnaround plan, then I feel much more comfortable about doing the audit. And that's going to be my eighth point. But that's a kind of general point, a kind of summing up point. So I'm looking for one more thing to audit, which I haven't mentioned in Part A. And you can pick various ones. Machines is quite a good one because machines have gone up quite a lot. Factories is another quite good one because factories increased by an, an enormous amount. But the, the biggest feature that I haven't discussed so far strikes me of, as being the change from an asset bank to an overdraft bank. And it's that that I'm going to go for for the last one. Overdraft. I will compare the overdraft of, what is it now, $65,000. Do you see it there in current liabilities? I will compare the overdraft of $65,000 to the limit to confirm the overdraft is authorised. To confirm the overdraft is authorised. I will compare the overdraft of 65000 to the limit to confirm the overdraft is authorised. And then our final point, going concern. The ability of the company to continue that one. Going concern. I will uh, assess the uh, reasonableness of turnaround plans uh, I will assess the reasonableness of turnaround plans to assess the ability of ambitious to continue 
I will assess the reasonableness of turnaround plans to assess the ability of ambitious to continue. Um, if they have no turnaround plans, then that presumably means they're going to carry on like this. If they carry on like this, then it does seem likely they're going to go bust. If they go bust, they're not going to pay our audit fee, in which case we might be starting to think of not doing any more audit. So that one there, really, really tremendously important. Well, that is analytical review. An analytical review is typically used most at the planning stage, which is why we've looked at it within the third chapter on planning. It's true. Analytical review is particularly important as a part of the process of risk analysis within the planning process. But as it happens, you can use analytical review at any point in your answer. So if the examiner asks you, you know, how do you audit something in the middle of an audit, you can give him some analytical review as an answer. If he asks you, how would you audit something towards the end of your audit, then you can use analytical review. So you can use analytical review in your answers throughout the exam and not just in planning. But it is true to say that the most frequently uh, found place where you will see analytical review is at the planning stage. Okay. <laughs>